Welcome to this uh, session on, on poetry. I'm Rachel um, and uh, I hope we'll have some fun. I'm not quite sure. I've got, I got as far as two points on what I thought I might say. So really it's, it's an opportunity, I think, for me in part to read you some poems to invite us to think yeah. a bit about how poetry might work as, as, as part of our lives as feminists and as feminist Christians or Christian feminists. But also it's an opportunity for us perhaps to reflect together a bit on how we relate to even the very notion of poetry. Um, I'm going to begin with a poem, though, because I think it, these things should begin with uh, poetry. Um, it's a, a poem which... I'm sorry if any of you have heard this before, but I, I often, when I'm actually doing straight poetry readings, I often start with this poem. Um, it's called Working It Out. Um, it's meant to be, at one level, quite amusing. Um, another level, I hope it makes quite a significant point about gender. Um, certainly my experience of it as a trans woman, and I will make no presumptions about who's trans or who's not trans, if there are, you know, gender queer people, if there are people who strongly identify as what's known as cis-gendered. Uh, um, but this is called Working It Out. Then a teen... Sorry, then a girl, a teen, tangerine in cheap spray tan, clicks onto the bus and sways towards the back. Her arse, a rolling fleshy pendulum in retro jeans. Her ease in four inch heels, the hypnosis of that arse she wields like a weapon, playing with her body as if she were a puppeteer adjusting a new doll's strings. A girl trying out what it's like to be a girl, trying to be a woman. Watching her from a distant evening, where I'm 24 again, conscious of those twin mounds on my chest, secretly raised over months, a pioneer shoveling earthworks at night, afraid to be seen, my stinging eyebrows thin as stiletto tips, the too bright lipstick huge on my lips, my eyes fixed ten feet ahead, and I'm flicking my own weak tight male arse out far and wide, side to side, picking my way down the street as if to a metronome's click as if this will grow it fat and round as an orange, flicking it like a boy, working out what it is to be a girl, working out what it is to be a woman. I want to draw attention in this session to a number of things, the, the way in which most significantly, I think, for me, that as someone said in the plenary earlier, that we shouldn't be talking about feminism, but really feminisms. And I'm very conscious that that particular poem draws attention to one particular reading of feminist theory, the notion that gender is performative, or that in very large measure there are any number of performative elements to it. And I think that we all ought to be attentive to the way in which, in some respects, that's, that's certainly where a lot of academic uh, feminism is at at the moment, under the influence of people like Judith Butler, who's uh, been hugely influential for me, um, and some of the materialist feminists like Karen Barad, who you may not have come across and who probably in the next 15 years will be people become very familiar with poetry for me has been a way of articulating a story but it's also much more than that and I, I will come on to that in a little while but I wanted to start really with you know tell tell me a bit about how you relate to poetry do you read poems 
yeah, most people in my experience, most women read, but mm. I'm intrigued about, do you read poetry? How, you know, what's, when was the last time you read a poem? When was the last time you went to a poetry reading? I find yeah. reading poetry is so much less satisfying than hearing it right. read and performed, really. Um, we're regulars at Greenbelt, and me and my youngest son always like to go to the spoken word sessions and listen to people performing their poetry. It's, it's fabulous, I love it, and it makes you think so much. But whenever I've bought a book of poems or read mm. poems, although I can enjoy them on some level, it's just nothing mm. like the same experience as hearing it. It just doesn't come over the same way. Mm. Thank you. That's probably a bit like reading a sermon, isn't it? Mm. You haven't got the person's voice properly, mm. have you? Now, especially with poets, poems that aren't necessarily on a fixed, um, they're more, more changing in their, their I don't know the poetic words for these things, but if they're not a regular rhythm, you can't get the sense of them properly if you've mm. never heard them before either. It's really right. hard. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting because I don't really, I don't really read poetry. I've got probably read two poetry books, I couldn't tell you who they're by. Um, and but I'm very interested in words and use of words. And I went to some poetry. I, I went to Greenbelt for the first time two years ago when it was really muddy and rainy. And <laughs> thought, oh, you have to queue for everything for hours. I can't do that. So I spent a lot of time in the poetry. <laughs> you didn't have to queue for that. You to go in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so I just heard a lot of poetry. That was the only thing I had. So it was probably the last time I heard poetry. But some of it was really, really good. Really thought provoking. Yes. Yeah, very good. So I'm just on the edge. I don't know. Okay. Anyone, anyone else? I went to a poetry reading, I think it was last summer, but it wasn't a poetry reading, it was Claire Mooney, who's a singer-songwriter, and halfway through she said, I'm taking a break, and I'm ashamed because I can't remember the girl's name. This woman just came along and read her own poetry, and it made us laugh, and it was about ordinary everyday things, about babies and signing on and all this sort of mm -hmm. thing. But you're right, it wouldn't have been the same if I just read it. Mm. It was the fact that it was her story and her emphasis and her passion in it that made them so brilliant. Um, mm. The first, um, I used to, I've always, I wrote poetry when I was younger, um, and then I stopped for a bit in my teens. And the first kind of poetry reading I went to was at Latitude Festival. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, I didn't grow up as a Christian, um, so I didn't really hear liturgy and poetry and stuff. And they had, um, they did, the music didn't start till three, and they had this poetry tent, which was open in the morning. I had these massive cushions that you could lie on. So we would just go, we'd, li we'd lie on the cushions. And we listened to poetry, and that was like my first experience, and I really enjoyed it. Um, and I've heard a little bit of Greenbelt, performed a little bit as a tiny venue at Greenbelt with a few people. Um, and yeah, I've done some performance poetry just in little SEM circles, mm. but nothing crazy. Anyone else? I read poetry as a child, bizarrely. Because one of the first books that I was bought was called For Your Delight, mm. which was an anthology, and because it had a poem that my mum loved in it, which was um, The Gingham Dog and the Calico Cat fire, side by side on the fireplace sat, and they have this fight. And when they come down in the morning, they just find all these bits of material because they've ripped each other to bits. <laughs> Very typical poem for my mum to like. And then when I was given some money for Christmas, I bought um, an anthology called, uh, I forget what it was called by, somebody I'd never heard of called Louis Entermeyer, but it was like quite a big children's anthology and it had some amazingly descriptive poems in it. And I read poetry a lot when I was a child, mm. but now I just tend mm. to read it functionally, like if I'm looking for something to use in a service, or sometimes yeah. if I'm looking... Yeah, I probably do that, but I probably don't class that as really reading. <laughs> well, I do, and, yeah. I, and I think particularly for people, like if somebody's going through a particular mm. situation, yeah, like a bereavement mm. or something, yes. like, sometimes you can find yes. a poem, mm. yeah. and it's like you're, you're saying, you're almost sort of saying, look, I can, I, can you identify with mm. this? Does it help you to voice Mm. some of what you're going through so yeah. I, I think it's something I would tend to see mm. as a use I mean, can thing. I, I mean it's really because the thing is I'm just very conscious yeah. that that in a sense you know being both a poet 
and being a Christian is, is I think there's something wrong with me in that I kind of enjoy being part of an mm. endang- endangered species. Because <laughs> there is, I mean, there is a sense when lots of people are now writing poetry, but very few people are reading mm. poetry. And if, I mean, people who are stellar people in my world, I mean, you've probably heard of Carol Ann Duffy, but below mm. Carol Ann Duffy, yeah. there's a whole lot of people who are just incredible people. Yeah. And they haven't got the profile of the equi- the equivalent mm-hmm. in the no- novel world, mm-hmm. and I'm just I'm very conscious that for me po- poetry is really has been really significant for me, and particularly you know in, in mm-hmm. uh, I I'm, I'm going to read perhaps a little bit from here from this book again in terms of articulating voice mm-hmm. and the way in which you know. Part, you know, when we have funerals, people often reach for some kind of poem. And I often think, and I often, I mean, I'm, you know, snob about these poems. I mean, I will always read them, but they're not generally poetry as far as I'm concerned, but they are, they're often verse Mm. that captures a sort of an emotion. But it shows that how poetry often enables us to do things that we can't otherwise do. And I believe that poet, but I actually then believe that poetry is something which we can use ourselves to articulate mm. ways of breaking open patriarchy, breaking op- open the Bible, rereading the Bible in a way which is not about being unfaithful, but is about embracing the fundamental creativities that mm. are, are in the heart at the heart of it. And we need to, you know, remember as well is that that for women in the and I'm, sorry, I'm a bit of a bore about this because I, you know, I, I'm. I'm writing a thesis about all of this at the minute, and I'm tempted to inflict you with a section of the thesis. Um, but um, that for for women, you know, we were traditionally denied the title of poet, known as poetesses, and it was a way of controlling and dismissing women. And yet, poetry became profoundly a profound tool for critiquing the establishment, and I think it still mm-hmm. can be. Uh, just can I just, I mean, it's just a little bit about voice, maybe, and why maybe we ought to think, of, take it seriously. And I, I want to encourage people to go away and write if you're not writing already. It doesn't matter if it's crap, you just <laughs> write. Because um, I think it's about voice, and I'm, you know, I talk here about how um, the experience of losing voice, partly because, and I, I say this, I hope, with some level of restraint and hum- humility is that one of the shocks that I had when I went from being you know a man in terms of my male identity to being a woman is I discovered how I stepped out of power and I became the object of the gaze you know that I no longer owned public space but I also was trained as a philosopher and that felt like a learning to use a voice that wasn't mine and then I became really ill with Crohn's disease, mm-hmm. and I felt like that stripped away another level mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. of my ability to control my world, mm-hmm. and so I reached for writing, and so it should come as no surprise that in searching for my own voice I should turn to poetry, for in searching for words I was looking for the way to express myself both precisely and yet in ways that enabled me to reimagine and reformulate myself. Poetry is incredibly precise, but powerfully suggestive. All art is liminal. That is, it stretches and extends the possible ways we encounter and comprehend the world. Poetry does this by precise and startling wordcraft. Words shape and create worlds. As Nicholas Lee notes, poetry witnesses to the transcendent, to the beyond in our midst, to the more than that beckons human beings beyond the immediate, the functional needs of the moment. And it will always be a kind of liberative praxis, because for me, or praxis, what I mean by praxis is the meeting point of what our practice, the stuff we do, and our sort of theoretical understanding. And it's always enmeshed. You know, we're not like, I'm a theoretical being, I'm a practical being. We're actually always doing that kind of stuff together. But it will always be liberative because poetry breaks silence. It breaks women's silences, but it also throw it, it, it shapes the world. I mean, going back to that first poem that I read, its aim is to sort of say as if you were in that moment. 
of me looking, but also me living. And if it's a successful poem, it, it kind of, you're there. And it's just doing it through words. And can I, let me, um, give you, I'm, I'm now thinking I'm not going to inflict, um, uh, my thesis on you. I'm just going to read some stuff. I didn't actually do many copies of these because I thought no one would come. Oh, <laughs> Honestly, I did. I really did. Because um, it's poetry. And, and you just... Yeah. Um, in fact, you can take have those because I think I've got these written down somewhere else. So it's like two. There's two poems: there's Tent Peg and Dread. Um, oh, is it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. I'm going to start with with. I don't think so. I mean, we can always get some extra. We can always re sort of photocopy if anybody does want. Has everyone got, uh, yeah. I've got dress, I've got a spare tent peg one, I don't want anybody use that. Um, so, I'm going to start with tent peg, um, just to say, you know, one of the things that I think we're invited to do is, is if we're going to be creatively engaged with the Bible, I'm sorry as feminists we're bloody well going to have to be, you know, I mean because, Partly because there are so many voices out there that are telling us mm -hmm. that you can't be a Christian and a, a feminist or that they re want to read the Bible in a quite prescriptive way. Whereas, in fact, the Bible is just, it's just a library of opportunity and possibility in which certain kinds of texts often get pushed down and others get prioritised. And in certain church contexts, and I, you know, I, I've got a bit of a beef with the evangelical church because I've had a bit of a, <laughs> a, bit of a rough time there um and still continue to have a bit of a rough time and do you know I've, the best thing i've ever been called was an agent of satan uh who infiltrated the church to bring it down from the inside so that's kind of good and this is just it's it's yeah yeah but this is this is a sort of tent peg is do we know the story of cicero jail Jail from judges, you know, well, no, the tent. That jail shoved a tent peg through some dude's head. Exactly, through Cicero's Cicero. head. And that this was, you know, a kind of profound liberative act, mm. I think. I mean, it's probably not often our idea of of what liberation looks like. And, you know, I'm not flag up. I'm a, I am a, a, a pacifist at heart. But <laughs> sometimes we, you know, it's like reclaiming, you know, it's that thing about women reclaiming a warrior dimension in themselves and what I mean by that is not sort of like going out and you know sort of getting an Uzi 9mm out but is actually saying that we we need to hold our ground because everything in our tradition is telling us to be polite discreet decorous I'm um, um, Judith and I'm so this is a, a re-reading this is a re-reading of of that tent peg. He wanted no fuss, just water and a place to rest, a blanket like a child. I gave him milk, smoothed the rug, lit candles, ran my palm across his sweating head, enjoyed his smile, unreserved like a baby discovering movement for the first time, the way he wanted to place his hand in mine, just to know there was someone else in the dark. I let him sleep. If he needed to run, he could dream. He had done enough. The peg might have been made for him. How easily it slid in his head soft ground. It was not how you think. He gurgled like a newborn, his legs kicking once. He might have said my name. I can't remember, why did you kill him? I can't remember off the top of my head, but it was it was at a point, it was like a critical point in the battle. 
and because mm-hmm. Deborah was the judge at the time. He'd come to hide, I think. Yeah. Yes. He'd run away and come to hide. Yeah. yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And she was, wasn't she sort of, yeah. Was she married? I, I don't know. There was such, she was expected to hide him, but then she, she killed him siding with her people, I That's think. That's right. Mm. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, that explains the beginning. Yes, yeah. right. Thank you. Mm. Any responses to that? Any kind of? Mm. Well, um, so I'm a rape survivor, and I recently went through the process of taking my ex to court, mm. and unfortunately, well, insufficient evidence. So he got off with that, and you know, I've I've quite like you know, I would quite like him dead. Yeah. Quite frankly, I would like him to die in a very slow and painful way. <laughs> I'm a pacifist and I would never do anything, but just stuff like this does make me feel liberated and um, voiced and um, justified, stuff like that. Well, you know, what? thank you for sh- you know sharing that, Lizzie. Um, we... Why, why is why is why are words dangerous? Why 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 is it that there was a time in history when things like the theatre were regulated? Why is it that there have been times when certain kinds of literature, uh, and I'm not talking about pornographic literature, but I'm talking about certain kind, you know literature that um, is, was seen to step outside of public morals was regulated, and it's partly because things like the words can create intense mm. moments. Mm. Um, but I, I mean, I'm very interested in how we use words to free ourselves sometimes from, you know, I mean, there's a sense in which one, one can never be free of, of certain kinds of violences that are done against us, but also not to be determined by them. And, you know, that yeah. Yeah. thing, I think. Yeah. yeah. That's uh, why... We use liturgy, isn't it? Because mm. the words um, have a meaning which is more than just what we might make up on the spot. Mm. Mm. Um, mm. Something that's been said before or that has a resonance because it's been carefully chosen. Mm. But that's also why we need to have some liturgy that has female images in it because that mm. is so difficult and. That, well, I don't remember ever experiencing that when I was young mm. um, and, and when you first hear that in, in an actual service that people are willing to talk about um, God in a feminine way it's, it mm. is it is really um, it's liberating and it it's, um, stretches your mind doesn't it it must affect everybody um, mm. not just women presumably it must affect men as well That's, mm. um, so the words that you use in poetry or in liturgy are affecting you on a different level from words you have just in a chat or a conversation with mm-hmm. maybe. Mm-hmm. And more carefully chosen. Mm-hmm. 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 One of the reasons I used that or thought it'd be good to look at that poem or read it is that it also hooks into a really important part of, of, of what shaped women's poetry since the 19th century. Um, it's no coincidence that effectively yeah, women, I, well in my view, invented something called the dramatic monologue in poetry. Most famous dramatic monologues are by men, generally. You know Robert Browning, My yeah, Last Duchess? Yeah. Yeah. That is a classic example of the Victorian dramatic monologue and we need to remember that prior to the 19th century they didn't exist Mm. and there was suddenly a point at which it emerged and there were a number of early Victorian writers who developed the dramatic (coughs) monologue and one of the sort of current feminist theories about that is that it was a way in which women could challenge their situation in society politically, socially and just religiously was by using different voices and this runs through to the present day. I mean, in some ways, you know, uh, 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 Caroline Duffy 
is the most famous example, modern example, someone who uses the dramatic monologue, the way of telling the story through the voice of someone that isn't their own. And again, I just invite you to, I mean, whether it's, it's if you're preparing a service, a sermon, or if you're actually stepping your toe into writing, to think about not only how you use your own voice, and thinking, I want to express my view, but how do you use a surrogate for that as well? Does that, does that make mm -hmm. some sense? Yeah, sort of using somebody else's voice to express a similar thing yourself. So, Absolutely. Um, <coughs> choosing a famous woman or an unfamous woman. Absolutely. Who's been through something you've been through. Sort of, yeah, sort of latching on to their story to tell your own. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. I will, but it's also, it's yeah, it is about that, but it's also, I mean, one of the classic things is to take maybe... A, a famous figure from the Bible, and I, if, if, how are we doing for time? Because I'd like to read at least one. Yeah, we're all right. Um, take a famous character from the Bible or from mythology, mm. and maybe reframe that story slightly. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that sometimes it can feel very difficult, particularly in certain contexts. I mean, if you're in an evangelical setting, that can feel yeah. very dangerous. Yeah. I, I quite like this. I like, I like the last bit talking about it. it was not how you think. Because quite often we don't get the other voices, do we? And quite a lot of biblical texts, we get the the voice that, that's from the male point of view that's mm, telling absolutely. the story and telling yeah. about the women and telling about this mm. happened and that happened. But actually, saying that, it's not how you think. It's not actually necessarily as you might first think from the voices you have here. Yeah. But there's something different going on. It's, it's quite... Um, mm. yeah, that's quite mm. profound. Yeah. Yeah, which I think you can, if you go into the story as a different character, you did the whole thing. Yeah, mm. it's um, just yeah. Sort of jumping sideways here. Yeah. Um, just, to, I mean, this is this book. Sorry, I don't, will give it a plug. It's my new my new book, and it's poems and of, and stories of passion and resurrection. And it takes the first section is very much about first person voices um you know people who were there during or could have been there during the final week of jesus's life mm. telling their encounters mm. with or you know around that um and again it does come from quite a feminist perspective um but i hope there's something in there for everyone but there's the central section is uh 15 new poems for the stations of the cross um and so <coughs> there's a new stations of the cross which is going into the cathedral mm later this week and these are the poems that I've written for them and I just I want to give you a couple of examples again of voice poems um maybe telling stories slightly differently um now I, I don't know how familiar you are with the Stations of the Cross I know it's not in everyone's tradition although I'm, I'm really delighted that you don't have to be a Catholic these days to really mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. it. Yeah. you can you know you really can yeah. can't you I mean it's, really? it's opened up and that's I take that as a real sign mm -hmm. of the spirit actually sort of opening up possibilities but one of the non-biblical scenes and of course because some of them are non-biblical that's what causes the anxiety in mm -hmm. some people is Jesus meets his mother mm -hmm. So this is kind of in the voice of Mary, the mother of God. Jesus meets his mother. It's the crowd in her head which kicks her now. Words awkward as elbows. Man, boy, rabbi, brother, son. All the faces he ever wore. Angry, fearsome, fearful, loving mad back to his childhood and the shock of weight when she took him in her arms back to that first night and her groan when the sack of afterbirth escaped her warmth back before it all began watching this day from that night wanting to take water and bathe him as she did